I'll leave it to you now, Nick Critchley. Thanks very much, Nicole. Uh, I can see we have 16 people that have jumped online and so uh, expecting a few more, um, but uh, I'll let them connect into the meeting as uh, I provide a, a, a brief introduction. Um, firstly, thanks for your time. I appreciate everyone in the industry is fairly busy at the moment with uh, things certainly ramping up in uh, 2021, as uh, I think most of us hope they would. Um, this is a Victorian ACRA committee seminar. We had planned to do a face-to-face uh, -face event, but uh, unfortunately with the uh, SNAP five-day lockdown we had a little while ago, uh, it uh, looked more and more like uh, we weren't going to be able to do a face-to-face, -face, so we switched to a webinar. Uh, our hope is that uh, uh, we're able to run the next series of events that we have planned face-to-face, because -face, uh, we certainly have do have quite a good calendar planned um, in terms of a, a women in engineering event. Uh, we're considering a, 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 a trade show. Um, we have a transport infrastructure event planned for uh, July as well. Um, and uh, we're also assessing a Christmas in July event. Um, so those of you in Victoria, there'll be further information to come uh, on those in the, uh, the coming weeks. Uh, today's webinar is on building defects um, and we have uh, three speakers uh, for today um, who will present uh, their topics uh, in relation to building defects. Um, the presentations will go for around about 20 to 30 minutes each um, and uh, what we will do, we will actually ask uh, participants to hold back their questions until the end of all three presentations. And if you can ask your questions uh, by using the chat button uh, at the bottom of your screen, which comes up when you move your mouse. And uh, we'll then uh, convene those through to the speakers for a response. Um, so our first speaker tonight um, is Dr. Nicole Johnson. Um, she is an admitted legal practitioner currently working as a senior lecturer and researcher at Deakin University's Business School. Uh, she's a co-leader of the Home Research Group, which is an interdisciplinary research network. And she researches strata-related topics from a socio-legal socio perspective. Uh, her PhD thesis examined how conflicts of interest detract from developers upholding governance responsibilities in the transition phase of multi-owned developments. Nicole is also chair of the International Research Forum on Multi-Owned Properties multidisciplinary research conference held annually and chair of the multi-owned properties research hub. So today Dr Nicole will be speaking on suggested examinations of building defects in residential and multi-owned properties from a legal perspective. Uh, I would ask you to put your hands together but probably not appropriate in this sort of forum but uh, we'll hand over to uh, Dr Nicole Johnson for her presentation. Thanks Nicole. Thanks very much, Nick, and thanks very much to ACRA for having me here today. I'm just going to share my screen. I've got a PowerPoint presentation. Um, and I will just say to everyone that um, at the end of the presentation, um, I've got a um, URL link there that can take you to uh, the actual research report um, that you're welcome to download um, and view. This is sort of really a snapshot of the research that was uh, undertaken um, in the last sort of um, couple of years. Um, and um, I hope that um, everyone understands the importance of research. So building defects is one of those things that we've been talking about in all different um, industry circles for many, many years. It's, it's certainly, I think, nothing new for everyone that's sort of participating in this webinar today. We've been talking about it, we've known about it, you've been working in it. And so of course, nothing new, but what is new from my perspective is the research um, that really looked into uh, the types of defects that we're seeing in residential strata products or apartment buildings and start to have a look at how do we unpack all these sorts of defects. So where are they located in, in, in the built environment? What are the causes? What are the contributors to? And um, to have a broader conversation about what is going on um, in this particular property domain um, and then how do we go about trying to fix this? And so, it's one of those funny things talking about it for a long, long time, but no one really actually put pen to paper and started to collate data to have a look at really what's going on in these buildings. So this project was really the first of its kind 
And it did, um, many of you may have seen, it did get quite a bit of press, um, a lot of media attention. And it was a little bit of a timing issue, I must say. Um, the report came out around about the same time as the Mascot Tower um, uh, issues came to the, to the fore. So um, a lot of people started talking about this particular research. And I really wanted today, you've got some experts that are gonna talk about more specifically about the work that they do from a sort of a, a more of a remedial um, perspective and what they see on the job. Mine is certainly from a, from a different perspective. I'm certainly not a construction expert. I'm a, I'm a lawyer um, and my research is around socio-legal issues. So I was very interested to, to talk to people about the impacts of defects in, in their built environment. And that was really how I framed my research. So what I wanted to do today is really just highlight what the research was about, because I think it's important to frame the research so you understand really what the aims of the project was um, and what data I collected um, to find out a little bit more about this um, particular topic. And then sort of more about what people have told me needs to change in the industry. And then um, I think um, our other two speakers can talk a little bit further to that. So I'll start just by talking about what the aims of the research project were. And we really had four main aims. What we were trying to do is just to really identify the types of defects that were um, impacting residential buildings. So what we hadn't seen before is a very clear identification or classification of the defects. We talked about it, we know water, fire, um, you know, cracking, slab cracking issues were sort of, you know, being discussed, but we hadn't been able to really clearly identify those very well. We wanted to understand those impacts. We wanted to assess those defects against the Australian regulatory environment to find out, was there something unique about our regulatory environment that is contributing to um, what is now really seen as a bit of a crisis in our residential property market. And then one aspect was really to understand how these defects are managed, because as you can imagine, in these large buildings, you have an owner's corporation or a body corporate, an owner's corporation in Victoria, and you've got a lot of um, owners who are novices usually about how these things are governed, how these property types are governed. And so we wanted to really know how they are managed, how people get information, what they're going through in that process of rectification. Um, and so we really wanted to get their insight. So that was also part of the aims of the project. So of course, um, for all research, and this can be a little bit boring, I understand for some people, but it's really important to um, look at what had come before us. So what other studies had been undertaken, not only in Australia, but around the world to really understand defects, because obviously defects is not a unique um, issue in Australia, there are defect issues in buildings all over the world um, in, in, in varying um, types. So we wanted to start by going back to, well, what has come before us? You know, what have people said about defects before? And one of the true difficulties, and I think many people find this, is to define what a defect is. And of course, those in construction think about defects, the term defect, very differently than what lawyers think about, because obviously defect or defect is a defined term under the relevant legislation. And in each state, it's very different. So how the Victorian legislation defines what a defect is and how it is categorised is very different from the other states. And truly something can only ever be really categorised as a defect once you go through a legal process and a court says that that particular issue or was it that shortcoming in a particular function um, or element within a building is a defect. So there's that sort of legal construct that, that we all grapple with. And then of course, there's this sort of more general understanding that um, many people in construction talk about. But what the literature said to us, what the previous research said, was this definition up here from what sort of, sort of covers everything. So we're talking about these failings or shortcomings in the function performance, statutory or user requirements um, in buildings, etc. So we sort of all know we have this general idea. As far as the types of defects, now there was very little work that had been done in Australia. There was really one seminal piece um, that really looked at it from a very specific um, perspective. And the main things that came out of this re that research was yes, water related defects were, were pro quite prominent, issues around wall cracking, guttering problems with roof problems and so forth. But what was really lacking in that research was anything to do with fire. Um, so fire related defects were, weren't really being 
being captured in research that had previously been done. And so this was sort of really a starter type of research project where they found these. Of course, Singapore, lots of water related defects there as well. Um, and Spain had done quite a few um, research projects in this area. But again, the type of data that they were using was very difficult um, to look at all different types of um, building products actually. So um, there was really not that much out there to be quite frank. Also, we found that people were talking about the different causes of defects without really understanding what the defects were all about. So a lot of people talked about these sort of human based causes of defects, you know, lack of supervision, lack of skill and those sorts of things. But really at the end of it, when you collate all the data together, when you collate all the information together, these causes are very interrelated. So we've got lots of issues contributing to building defects in these types of properties. Again, that sort of classification of building defects is another tricky one. People talk about major and minor defects, technical, functional or aesthetic type of defects. Again, there's no consistent language around how we classify defects. And that's what I've tried to do in this research report, which I'll show you in a moment. Of course, the impacts of defects defects, you would think that there would be a lot of studies that look at how these sorts of defects impact upon the built environment and residents that reside within, um, things around risk to life and health effects. Um, so again, very little, but what we're starting to see is there's some issues around the health impacts around dampness in properties. And I think we're going to see much more work in that area to come because mould is a huge issue or biotoxicity in these buildings is becoming a big issue. And of course, it's about the regulatory environment. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this today about does our performance based regulatory system that we have in this area, is that a contributor or a cause of what we're seeing in relation to these defects? Because it's a different type of regulatory system. It's not quite like most of the regulations that we see that regulate our daily lives. So we have to question these things. So what did I do in this research project? And I must be really um, clear here that this was a pilot research um, report and uh, or project, and we've still got a lot, lot to learn about defects. There's lots of missing things in this data that we still need to examine and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to do that um, later in the year. But what we did do is we looked at building audit reports. So we looked at uh, 212 reports and they were analysed. And of those two, this is Australia wide or sort of the east coast of Australia more, more, more predominantly. And what we found from those 212 reports that we analysed, there was about over 3000 line item defects. So when I say line item defects, that is really where the auditor has gone through and actually provided each of the defects. But sometimes they, they'll they use um, a plural um, term when there's multiple defects. So if you've got water coming in and it's impacting upon, um, you know, the internal um, walls in, in, in a particular apartment or a number of apartments, they will just say, you know, um, there's been water ingress in those areas. And so it's plural, it's not identifying singularity of these defects. So the 3000 defects is really a conservative estimate of the number of defects that were in those 212 buildings that were analysed. We were also looking at new buildings. So we were looking in for, for the Victorian ones, we were looking in the first 10 years of a building's life. And what we needed to do, which was one of the complexity, and many of you may have seen these sorts of audit reports, they're often um, commissioned by an owner's corporation when they first get in, they're noticing some of these defects, they will engage uh, a building auditor to come in and have a look at their, their defects. And so you'll see these documents, they're all very different. There's no standardisation in relation to how these reports are actually um, uh, put together. And so we had to work out how we extract the information, sort it and organise it so we could analyse the data. And that was a really tricky, tricky part of this research project. We also undertook a number of interviews with people and we also did a review of the regulations to see, you know, what is going on in that particular area. So let's get on to the more exciting parts. What did we see? So when I was going through these reports, we decided to create this sort of construction system classification um, uh, matrix 
uh, to work out where everything sits. And so we've got um, a number of different construction systems or systems, so, you know, access and egress. It, it, this is sort of fairly common for, for most of you that are sitting here listening today, um, how we've categorised this. There's a few missing pieces, we realise this, and, and that will be improved over time. But as a way to sort the data into something, to make sense of the data, to work out where these defects are actually sitting within the built environment. So this is the construction systems that we used. And so what did we find? So when we extracted all the data and we analysed it, what we found was that most of the defects that we were identifying were around building fabric and cladding. Okay, and so that was a large proportion of how we categorised a lot of these defects. And that was a little bit surprising to me, but there's a reason why that um, that happened and that'll become apparent in a moment. So this is across the jurisdictions that we looked at and we found that building fabric and cladding was the construction system most impacted by building defects in the residential um, market. Fire protection was the second, waterproofing, roof and rainwater disposal and structural defects and then they go down from there. And today I'm going to concentrate on those top five. Okay. One thing that was really interesting, interesting when we looked at these buildings is that um, Buildings don't are, are not isolated to the type of defect that they have. So what we found on average was there was about 14 different types of defects that were identified on average in any building. So this is not just about in any particular building, just about waterproofing or just about fire safety. You're finding in these buildings that there are a different range of defects impacting. So it's not about one construction type or one type of trade um, or element that's being impacted. It's multiple elements that are being impacted. And so there was about roughly approximately six different systems that were impacted by building defects. Okay, so on average about 14 different types of defects per building and of those they were sitting within about six different construction systems. So there's lots of different problems here in these buildings. Now why I said that building fabric and cladding in some way surprising in another way it's not. It's really all to do or most of it is to do with water. So when we were categorising this, if you had defects that were coming up in, for example, in the ceilings or in the internal walls, so we're talking that still about the sort of building fabric, um, that might have been because of water ingress and that's what we found most of the time. So I think we can safely assume that water and fire are still our big issues here. So as you can see, when we put it all together, we were looking at the consequences and contributors contributors to all the different construction system defects, that water ingress and moisture in buildings was about 30% as a contributor. So what was happening in the data is you may have, and this is how I explain it, and I may be explaining it incorrectly um, from my perspective, but when I'm talking about water coming in or anything to do with water, you may have an originating defect. So it may be that there's a waterproofing problem. And then of course, water then comes into um, other places within in the property and then impacts maybe that sort of building fabric or cladding areas. So you're getting these resulting defects based on an originating defect that usually has to do with the water coming into the building in some way. So yes, it looks like on the surface that, you know, this sort of um, uh, building fabric and cladding is the main one. And it's, it's mainly because of water coming in and impacting upon those particular elements within the building. So I wanted to show you exactly how the type of data that we got and how we extracted and how we've categorised this. And this is a bit more of, of a breakdown in, in those core areas. So um, I might have to push on a little bit quicker than I anticipated because I'm running out of time. But on the right hand side, uh, the examples of defects are reported. So these are the sorts of terms that we were provided with. This is how people were um, um, uh, you know, writing up their reports, the words that they were using. So these are all the different types of examples that are outlined in these reports. Then we're putting them into some type of subcategory based in this particular construction system, which is building fabric and cladding. So we had issues around, you know, joinery, or we classified them to joinery, lightweight cladding. So we had ceilings, walls, suffetes, and so forth, masonry issues, and that sort of thing. And so then you can see on the other side, within that particular construction system of building fabric and cladding, 
that masonry and lightweight cladding were the two areas that were most prominent when we were looking at these sorts of defects. But as I said, all this information is actually in the report so you can have a look in more detail um, at your own leisure. Fire protection. So this was a really interesting one um, because what I think some of the issues are around fire protection, particularly around some of the passive fire um, system defects, is that oftentimes when people are going into these buildings to do these audit reports, they're doing observational reporting only. So I think we're missing out on a lot of type of hidden defects in these sorts of reporting. And I think as people that are in the room um, or in the virtual room, um, when they go out on site and they're doing any sort of um, rectification or remedial work, they're often finding these sort of other hidden type of defects and, and that hasn't been captured well in any type of research. And that's really important important to note that we're seeing this, we understand that this is a bit of an issue, but passive fire was certainly um, an issue that's been raised. Roof and rainwater, um, again, you can see sort of some of the examples that were reported, um, not surprising to many people, and I think um, Byron may talk about this, but around um, roof cladding and guttering in particular, um, and we hear this all the time, some of the real issues around those box gutter, um, you know, with lack, lack of overflow and that sort of thing is, is continuing to be a bit of a problem in relation to roof and rainwater, but again sits under this domain of, you know, water impacts or water ingress into buildings. Waterproofing, yes, big issue, especially around the membrane failures, which Byron will talk to. Um, balcony membranes out of all the different membranes came out as the number one uh, type of defect. Um, that we're seeing um, very commonly, but also internal wet areas. And of course, there are a lot of cost um, issues associated with uh, remedial work around waterproofing. So that does have a huge impact on the lives of people that reside within these sorts of buildings. Structural, mainly stuff around the slab, um, cracking of structural cra um, uh, of slab issues in relation to adequate, inadequate um, grading and those sorts of things were a very common theme in these reports. So a real issue around those sorts of structural elements. But as you can see, we broke it up in relation to sort of framing foundation, curtain wall and so forth. So just because of timing, I've just gone through that fairly quickly, but as I said, a lot more detail is in the, in the actual report. But it was really interesting when we spoke to stakeholders and end users in our interview process to find out, to dig a little bit more deeper about what is actually going on in this environment. And certainly the issues around the regulatory environment was highlighted as a pr prominent um, issue. Many said to us that there is a real disconnect between the National Construction Code and Australian standards. And as I've gone around and spoken about this research to more and more people, this has been made really clear to me that there's a real issue with people interpreting these um, codes and the Australian standards, their disconnect between them, the cost of Australian standards, um, and I've seen the cost of it, it's exorbitant, it's, it's amazing that to me that people have to pay these sorts of costs for these sorts of standards to do their job well. Um, little guidance for rectification specialists. So many people told us when, when they go back on site to do the remedial work, you know, there's no real guidance. The National Construction Code is there for new builds. It's not there to fix um, you know, these problems. And so people said that many times they're on, on sites and they're just trying having to create, create their own processes to deal with these rectifications. So there's a real lack of guidance there. The piecemeal approach is problematic. And of course, many people have talked about the private certification system, which, which to me is just that there's a real misalignment between what the expectations are about what that is, you know, building surveyors going out on site and doing inspections and what the reality is, especially in terms of the legislation. They talked about those common defects. The same things came up a lot, fire safety, water penetration, building fabric defects, combustible cladding, obviously, over the last few years. And then people started to talk to us about the balcony glass panels shattering. Causes, same sorts of things that we've spoken about, misuse of products, poor workmanship, time pressures, poor supervision, lack of training, lack of licensing, trade accountability and so forth. And then of course, all these time pressures where you see much more time pressure in these sorts of apartment buildings than other type of, um, other type of buildings. 
of course, this idea of um, responsible um, responsibility avoidance. So many of these companies, both the builder and the developer, are creating single purpose vehicles um, when they're creating these new um, property types. And then, of course, when the day is done, they're you know liquidating these businesses and off they go and there's no one to sue. So it's very difficult um, for owners and owners corporations to make people responsible for these issues, which is having a huge impact. And of course, there's massive impacts on committees and lot owners. Physical health concerns we're starting to see around mould and biotoxic um, environments, psychological health and stress of dealing with this really complex area of building defects. It's really concerning um, for many people. I think I'm going to run out of time. Nick, is that right? Uh, Nicole, you, you, you're going OK. So uh, okay. we're 23 I've got a few minutes, more minutes in. You, no, okay. you've got eight minutes before okay. you get to half an hour. So um, All right. yeah, I'll keep going then. That. OK. So I wanted to um, talk a little bit more about the regulatory environment because I know that for so many of you working in industry, you're seeing these sorts of defects. That's so not, nothing really that surprising, but I really did want to talk a bit about um, the regulatory environment and how or do we know the extent to which it is impacting upon um, this issue of building defects. And so, of course, each state, as we all know, has a different um, generally a different framework from the building regulations, but of course, they all adopt the National Construction Code in a different way, and there are certainly some amendments around that. But essentially, the main objectives that underpin building regulation in Australia is really to promote the proper construction of buildings. That's up Sent and front, are, uh, front and centre in any type of um, building regulation, and also ensuring the health and safety of people using those buildings. So, the purpose or the objective of legislation is very, very clear. Um, that is what the how the legislation should be drafted with those sorts of purposes being kept it in mind um, to make sure that we are pr promoting that proper construction and we're sure ensuring health and safety of people. Now, um, building regulations, like any type of regulation, can either be created prescriptively or different types of models or regula regulatory systems um, can be used. So most regulation or legislation that regulates all different parts of our lives are very prescriptive. There's very clear legislation that you must follow. You can't opt out of things. This is how it goes. Okay, very prescriptive. The building regulatory system is very different. It is a performance-based regulatory system. So there's reasons why this has been created, and we've seen a real shift over the last 30 years from uh, to this performance-based regula regulatory system. And the reason why this has been implemented is really it's been seen as a much better approach for building regulations because they can be better, they can better accommodate technology change, because as we know, a lot of legislation is very slow moving. And so um, this type of regulatory system allows for um, it to move more easily, for changes to be incorporated into the regulatory system. Um, to for international for, you know and international trade products that are coming in all the time it's sort of able to accommodate it more flexibility um, really to um, optimize construction costs and rely less on bureaucratic processes and it's more about professional accountability so that is common for all types of performance-based regulatory models or systems, okay? It's providing for that flexibility. People saw the need to have a different type of regulation, regulatory system to accommodate the changes in the building environment, okay? To be more modern and flexible and savvy. Okay, so we see this really in the National Construction Code. So if you look at the National Construction Code, it provides those sta standards, as we all know, in which buildings must comply, but it's, but it's flexible. Um, there is some prescriptive parts of the National Construction Code, but you've all got that, also got that flexibility to implement new types of products and also new types of ways of doing um, building works. So, does this type of regulatory system cause or contribute to building defects? Well, maybe. So we haven't done a lot of research in this area to have a look at how well this type of regulatory system works. Should we be more prescriptive because what have we seen? Or, or is it really about that flexi the flexible nature of this sort of system? And so the only way that we can really um, 
uh, you know, the only sort of research that has been done is probably in New Zealand, especially after the leaky building crisis. So there has been limited research at investigating the effectiveness of this type of system generally. However, the leaky building crisis gripped New Zealand in the early 1990s and early 2000s has provided us with a really great case study to explore the weaknesses and um, of the regulatory system and how that actually relates to building defects. It has been suggested that inadequately, uh, inadequate regulatory accountability was a problem in the New Zealand system. And more specifically, the concerns have been that the stated goals of the regulations were imprecisely drafted, leading to interpretation issues. There was inadequate uh, regulatory oversight, so there's a real lax review of alternative product, products and over-reliance on poor, poorly trained building inspectors, and licensing and education was generally a lacking across the different industries. So as we can see that these are some of the issues that the more recent debates have really highlighted um, in the Australian context, that these are some of the things, especially from the Building Confidence Report, that we need to change. It's all about accountability. It's all about ensuring that that so licensing and, and qualifications um, are updated. Um, we've done a lot around, you know, using these alternative products, still probably have a way to go in relation to that. But this is a bit of a symptom of the type of regulatory system that we have. So we have to be we have to be more thoughtful about is this part is the are these issues connected to the regulatory system? And I think it's one of many. I think we can't when we're talking about building defects, it's not necessarily looking at one issue. And I've had many people contact me over the last couple of years to say, I know what the problem is, I know how to fix it. It's just absurd because there are so many interconnected and complex issues here at play that we can't just isolate them. It, it's a whole more of a holistic overview that we need to look at. So just some conclusions here and in the conclusion section, I just really wanted to talk about what the stakeholders were recommending for change. Because as I said at the beginning, I'm not a construction expert, expert, but I've listened to a lot of people that are very knowledgeable in the area. And so these are some of the key things that came out. Yes, around the regulatory environment, a lot of people talked about having best practices instead of having minimum standards within the National Construction Code and the standards, we need to elevate that up. People have discussed having a two-tiered construction code. So looking at higher rise buildings as much more complex type of buildings that need to have very different types of standards that must be applied or qualifications um, that regulate that particular type of building product. Strengthening private certification system or the building surveyor, which I think you know, is starting to move forward. Extending statutory warranty insurance, um, I think that will be a bit difficult, but people are discussing it. Changes to the Australian standards, but I must say I get emails, I feel like every second day where there's been changes to the Australian standards or people can um, um, make submissions in relation to changes to Australian standards. Certainly increased engagement with industry. And this was a really big one that came out for me because I had so many people that are very experienced in their own area that said to me, we, we have been talking about this for many years. We've gone to government with some real clear guidance about what needs to change and they've been really ignored. And so many of them are at the point now where they're just exhausted and they can't push forward. So having, you know, people need to recognise that, that there are really, you know, fantastic people in the industry that can really need to contribute to this conversation. Increased education for trades and, and strata managers, um, especially around licensing. And definitely we need better protection for lot owners and owners corporations. But of course, as a researcher, I want more research so we understand this area um, in much more detail. Before I go, I'd like to thank the partners on my research project. They all contributed um, to, to it. Getting data from industry is a very, very difficult thing. So if anyone wants to ever participate in research in relation to building defects or rectification, please get in contact with me. And as I said, um, you'll, you can get the report there at the bottom. Um, that's the link that you can get it. If, if you forget, you can just email me. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn and I think um, the report's on LinkedIn somewhere as well. But thank you very much for your time. Um, and I look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations and the questions from everyone. Thanks so much. Brilliant, Nicole. Uh, 
very interesting presentation and uh, your timing was uncanny. I think uh, ran about 20 seconds over, so perfect timing, good on you. Um, uh, just a reminder, we'll, we'll hold questions off to the end, but uh, as they do come to mind, feel free to lodge them on the Q&A button. They will just park there till the end. Uh, at which point in time we will uh, discuss with the presenters. Um, and uh, just uh, for uh, registrants to be advised that um, Nicole uh, from ACRA will actually send out uh, Dr. Nicole Johnson's uh, report to all uh, registered attendees today. So you'll get a copy of that report. Um, okay, now on to our next uh, presenter, which is uh, Byron Landing. And uh, Byron's the Director of Waterproof Awareness and a committee member of the ARW. Byron's going to present on the seriousness of waterproofing in all classes of building. Uh, he has over 20 years in, of construction industry experience, both as a wall and floor tiler waterproofer contractor and his former Melbourne Polytechnic trade school school teacher, uh, course designer and resource developer in the Certificate 3 in Construction Waterproofing. Uh, Byron's company is dedicated to improving the waterproofing industry by linking education with industry, contractors with builders, and providing general awareness about the many scenarios that can cause membrane failure. Having taught waterproofing over the last seven years to over a thousand students and developing a course based on recent industry trends and issues, he has a solid knowledge base to inform industry to minimise the risk of failure for all parties involved. He is passionate about improving the industry and understands that collaboration is the key to do so. Uh, so on that note, I will hand over to Byron and uh, ask you to share your screen and uh, take over the presenting. Thank you very much, Nick, and uh, very grateful for the opportunity to present. So I'll just get my screen up and uh, we'll get into it. So hopefully everyone can see my presentation. I can't see everyone. Um, yep, thumbs up, good on you, Nick. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, ACRA for the opportunity to present and um, the AIW, the Australian Institute of Waterproofing, they've really helped me progress um, and I'm grateful for to be um, on board as a committee member and to try and help improve Australia's leaky building syndrome. So. We do have an Australia's leaky building syndrome. And for those who think that we don't, um, I'd suggest taking a look at Nicole's report. Um, it's something that I've studied over a couple of years now. And I actually met with Nicole several years ago um, and to discuss her report. And so really drove my passion to try and help improve education and get on board with associations such as the AIW and now hopefully ACRA as well because um, collaboration is the key. So I've got two screens. So if you see my head going from side to side, I apologize, but one's got a little bit of some notes on there and obviously the presentation. So who is the Australian Institute of Waterproofing? We represent the in interests of the total industry in raising the standard of waterproofing in Australia by becoming the central source of knowledge augmented by members experience to mentor continuous change. And in uh, the attendee list today, we have from the ARW, Paul Evans, the President and Chairman, David Hepworth, the Secretary, and Carl Wooten, the Treasurer. We are currently collaborating with uh, ACRA now, and we look forward to strengthening a, a good collaboration and affiliation with them. Standards Australia, we have several co committee members who are working on Standards Australia on BD 038 for the revision of AS 3740, waterproofing of domestic wet areas, one being Carl Wooten, who's on here today. Victorian Building Authority, we've been um, conducting several webinars, um, training webinars with the building inspectors on how to identify and inspect waterproofing appropriately, both from a planning stage, but also uh, so planning and design and a visual perspective as well in internal, external and below ground or below grade waterproofing sectors. And we've been working with um, the master builders of Victoria in referring people over to the short courses in internal, external and below grade waterproofing. So, we're heavily involved and we want to create more collaborations within industry to try and help bridge the gap on how long this leaky building syndrome will be around in Australia and it will be around for quite some time. 
So I have stolen one of Nicole's quotes, Dr. Nicole Johnson. I think you've got a crisis in the country and she couldn't have been more bang on in, um, in that statement. Water penetration issues in buildings are much, much bigger. As I alluded to earlier, I spoke, uh, sat down with Nicole over lunch to, from an educational teacher to teacher um, meeting to talk about her findings and waterproofing issues um, are generally long-term and lead to structural defects, um, which cost the industry a considerable amount, not only financially, but psychologically. So in terms of failed waterproofing, many internal and external failures occur in the four to seven year mark from, the, um, from what I hear with industry consultation around Australia and through my own personal leak inspections and in below ground situations, it's not uncommon to see water ingress issues before the construction is even incomplete, is, is completed. So in terms of the pyramid, we can see on the right hand side, which is estimated percentages of failure, installation of waterproof membranes, but installation of substrates, so building elements contribute highly uh, to that figure being so high. Now it does alter from um, internal, external to below grade. And, and obviously you speak to different people around Australia and they, these percentages um, change a little bit. Also design contributes significantly to why we have water ingress issues, not only from waterproofing, but as Nicole alluded to as well from roofing and cladding. So we have more parapet wall, um, parapet style design buildings now. It's a square box shape, no eaves, no watershed principle. We catch the water within the building and then we try and direct it to the drainage outlet. And if it's not detailed appropriately, we see a uh, high risk of failure. And materials. So the materials percentage can alter from um, internal, external and below ground waterproofing um, failures so they do alter a little bit but it's a good guide to show you where we are and you know the Deakin report supported by industry experience point to the common causes of failure in the construction process being a focus on cheapest prices and speed or rushing the job. Now if we have a look at the list on the left hand side which is extracted from AS 3740 so the waterproofing of domestic wet area standard which was initially created back in 2004 and all of these items are still highly relevant today. So if we look at the physical results where we know that waterproofing defects uh, at diabolical um, standpoint in the industry, we would have to think that 17 years later, education is a key thing that's been lacking. And so, we talk about workmanship. I'm not going to break all of these down because that would take half an hour on its own. But workmanship is a, is a is a big factor in terms of not only the waterproofing installation, but the actual construction method across a whole range of trades um, in the construction industry, in many, many trades. And teaching at cert certificate three level, which was uh, what would be the apprenticeship scheme, a lot of apprentices may also only learn certain facets of their trade. And this is um, quite common with what we see, particularly in plumbing. The pace that we build now, the volume sector. So we have class two buildings where we have obviously multi-level um, developments. There's, a, there's tight frames, a really tight building frames that are allowed, penalties for going over those frames in the class one. So detached housing sector, the volume sector, the margins allowed for quality work is low and, and companies can tend to focus on a specific niche area and not do the entire trade as such. An apprentice goes on to become a qualified tradesman and then goes out and performs tasks that they may not have suitable training over a long period of time. The, the so understanding of material technology and properties Applicator skill and competence, application to a variety of use situations, change in design trends. So like I was talking about the watershed theory and parapet style buildings that we have now. Quality control, including supervision, inspection and testing. 
maintenance of waterproofing medium when disturbed. So the remediation of buildings, how do we go in there? We don't have guidance and documentation to, to give us appropriate guidance on how we need to do that. Fixture of fittings after waterproofing and tiling and a professional attitude. So dot point I is, is a really good one to focus on from a teaching perspective. And, you know, I classify myself um, as, as a teacher who teaches compliance in, in waterproofing. Professional attitude and a desire to continuously improve without compromising quality, performance and contractual obligations where they exceed minimum requirements. So I can personally probably put my hand up for this scenario. A lot of the people working in the construction industry may fall into a trade or have little or no um, direction once they leave school, fall into a trade. And in the space of Victoria, which is where we're presenting on today, many trades have not re been required to have trade registration or licensing. I know there's an onset of that coming in and we at the IOW highly support that. So that's allowed people to get into an industry where the construction of buildings has diabolical effects when it goes wrong and they don't have a prop, the appropriate amount of training or continual development to maintain changes in, des, changes in design trends, understanding the material technologies, understanding the codes and the standards. A lot of these things are never enforced to be taught. So we basically just learn through process and obviously now the physical results are showing us that that's a flawed method and also the design and construct method. So where buildings are designed, even from a, a design team, not having the appropriate understanding of watershed principles, for example, a building's designed, the builder is also under knowledge. They are basically managers of the trades and putting a high reliance on the subcontractor to be an expert. But how can they be an expert if they haven't had the appropriate training? So we've known about this problem for quite some time. In 2010, the ABC reported 85% of respondents in buildings built since 2000 said their buildings were defective. The same article also reported that according to one estimate, 70% of buildings leak. So in 2017, the Victorian Building Authority, the VBA, labelled waterproofing as a possible systemic issue and announced that it's conducting an inquiry into response to reports about the leaky building syndrome. Move forward to 2021, and we're now in the realisation that we are in a leaky building syndrome in Australia, and we haven't learnt from previous other countries' mistakes, such as New Zealand, Canada, and the other countries that Nicole discussed earlier. So what I want to do is we can't cover it all in a half hour period. I'll talk about two specific classes of building, residential buildings, so class two, apartment multi-level dwellings, and class one, so detached houses. So these are all um, cases that us at the ALW have come across over a number of years. So this one is a prominent building, 6K out of the CBD in Melbourne, 14 years old. I personally conducted 50 balcony inspections. There's 50 balconies on this building. All of them uh, were non-compliant to the building code all requiring rectification works. Some of the balconies up on the higher levels would be between 50 to $100,000 to rectify, with the average of the repair bill uh, being approximately $20,000. So the balcony is contributing to significant deterioration to common ground, which has the OC and the apartment owners that are stalemate and in a legal battle now. And in terms of this, picture on the left, uh, top left-hand side with the circle, we can see a central waste outlet. And this sized area of square meters was 50 square meter balcony with one central outlet to achieve falls to the waste, which is just inadequate. So the design has contributed significantly to the building being a ticking time bomb. If we have a look at the picture directly underneath that, we can see one balcony directly with water freely running off the edge of the balcony, significant 
concrete deterioration and efflorescence. And then I'll zoom in on the picture so that we can uh, have a bit of a closer look and why we have a star mate now. So we have common ground, which is from the edge of the balustrade out uh, to the facade of the building. So we've got water running off the owner's property up here, landing onto the property beneath, and then also onto the common ground, onto the facade of the building. So technically the owner of this property would be responsible to repair both the balcony beneath and the facade of the building. And in terms of class two buildings, where we have a top-down approach, here we can see the area under a large podium, which is on the lower levels, concrete spalling um, from water running through that podium down into the car park. We can see a car parked beneath. So when we have um, steel corrosion, that rust landing on the, the occupant's paint surface would damage it for the life of the car. And then we see large structural cracking in the basement slab as well. So this, this building is, is a quite a serious issue. 400 metres up the road, we see another class two building built around the same period of time, 2000 to 2012. This one's yeah, around the same period of time, 12 to 14 years old and compromising of 18 separate apartments with over half of the balconies which have undergone rectification works and inadequate rectification work where the tiles remained on the surface, they had waterproof membrane applied directly over the top of tiles and then tiling back over the top of that. All that is doing is prolonging the issue. So this picture in the middle here, we can also see serious um, deterioration to the cladding on the outside of the building on the picture on the left. The, the large one in the middle here, which was the penthouse balcony, which Paul Evans from the Australian Institute of Waterproofing actually conducted the rectification of this penthouse, which was in excess of $50,000. Once again, we see a top-down approach. What we've got here is the basement car park. And this deck up on top of the basement is actually, we can see the structural joist here, which is a timber joist, which is holding up the deck on top of this basement car park and has actually closed the basement car park for this building. And when the ceiling lining of the basement was removed, we can see the joists there, which have significant deterioration as well. So another class two building where the OC and the homeowners are um, at war, basically. Now this class one building, so triple story townhouse, actually only, <laughs> no more than two kilometers away from those two previous case studies that we showed you. Early estimates, estimates, so I conducted a leak inspection on this and a fellow colleague conducted a building inspection. Early estimates of, estimates of the rectification bill for this property are around $200,000. So this property was built 16 years ago and the current owner purchased the property three years ago which had a building report um, conducted on the building. The roof plumbing has multiple areas of non-compliance. The cladding around the entire building needs to be replaced. All balconies are defective with the bottom left having previous repair work and allowing extensive water ingress into the building. The brickwork at the lower level of the building has no damp proof course installed. And to compound that, when the council uh, did a footpath upgrade, they actually sloped the footpath back to the building as now, which is leading to rising damp and efflorescence up the facade of the building. These two properties that are joined to the triple story townhouse built by the same builder, this balcony has had rectification work um, already onto the property. The, the one next to that has extensive leaking issues. And in terms of how this bottom picture has been rectified and this balcony is membrane over the top of tiles, which has now prolonged the issue and caused further extensive structural issues to the timber joist, which we'll see on the next slide. 
So here's a um, picture of the balcony that's been repaired and underneath it, we can see yellow tongue flooring, which was used as the substrate. And we have a severely deteriorated timber joist that's into the beam. And so we've told the homeowner to not use the balcony until it gets rectified. So I've got a little video just to show you the bathroom underneath that balcony. And this part that you can see initially here is the bedroom that's adjoining that bathroom. So here we have two different failure points. We have a ceiling that has significant damage from the balcony above with uh, what appears to be black mold developing on the back of the plasterboard lining. Substrate is yellow tongue flooring and the balcony has been repaired Again, by membrane and tiles over the top. And here we have a shower enclosure, tiled shower base, which would have no doubt no water stop beneath the shower screen, which is allowing moisture to escape from the designated shower enclosure and severely deteriorating the timber. So in terms of that water stop not being installed for a tiled shower base, that is something that we all see at the AIW as a very common failure point for internal um, waterproofing failures, not only in the class one building sector, but the class two. I'm actually going to invite David Hepworth um, from the RW to run through this slide in terms of waterproofing regulatory environment. So David, I believe you should be able to unmute yourself by holding down the space bar or potentially Nick can unmute you also. You there, mate? Hold the space bar down, David. There we go. That's better. Can you hear me now? Got you now, mate. How are you? Thank you for jumping on, David. Okay, that's fine. Look, the, the purpose of this slide is to highlight the difference between the requirements of the new build works, which is what Nicole mentioned earlier on, and the issue in Victoria relating to remedial works. Uh, the new build works, as, uh, as she mentioned earlier, has uh, the overall arching uh, national perspective of the National Construction Code uh, with two options of performance are, are deemed to satisfy performance or a performance solution which needs to be ticked off by a building inspector before the builder commences. And the normal process uh, in a new build is that you have a registered building practitioner who takes the, uh, the head contract. He will then use, uh, more often will use a tradesperson to do the works, but he is required to supervise those trades if they're not a registered practitioner. And really that means pretty well everybody else but an electrician and a plumber. Um, it... Uh, and only in Victoria can the registered builder under the building regulations issue a compliance statement. Quite often, uh, waterproofing tradesmen are asked for a, 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 a statement of compliance. In fact, they can't give one in the state of Victoria. They can give a statement from their own company saying to the builder or somebody else that, I've done a good job as according to the standard, but that really doesn't mean anything when it comes to a dispute. Um, and the building regulations nominate that the 
the building register uh, surveyor uh, is the one that's got to check off compliance before they get a certificate of occupancy. And when it comes to our remedial works, of course, there's, uh, there's a lot of, um, a lot of, or lack of legislation. And again, Nicole mentioned this earlier on. And if a job doesn't require a building permit, then a tradesman can work up to the value of $10,000. And he doesn't have to have it, his work registered to by a, or supervised by a building practitioner. And this, there's no compliance statement. So it's very much buyer beware. Um, and when it comes to issues relating to um, a defect, but it's nominated as a repair or, or maintenance, it can be covered under the building regulations under schedule three, which has clause three that nominates that particular type of work. And again, there is no requirements to meet a particular standard because quite often the contractor is in the situation where he's trying to make good from a bad building practice in the first place. So there's no possibility of actually uh, meeting the original standard. Which the the is, oh, sorry, David, continue on. Did you hear that? Uh, I did hear that. Yeah, I, I was going to say that, you know, clearly, the issues that are faced with those couple of slides where we had the class one building defects and the class two, where originally it was constructed, um, which would fall into non-compliance with the building code. And now to rectify the building, very hard off the design to ensure that it's going to have a solution that is fit for purpose for a long period of time. So it's very, very difficult. It's uh, it's, it, the contractor, if he's if he's employed, if he's not a a, a registered builder, and he's trying to do a remedial work for um, for the owner, for instance, yeah, he's in the, they are in the situation where the, the, he should be telling the owner, look, this is a, a buyer beware situation. Effectively, you we are going to do the best we can, but there are some structural elements we can't we can't fix. Yeah. So in short, we need to try and build it right the first time, David. It's really the issues have occurred primarily because it have been bad building practices. Yep. And in a perfect world, if we had better building practices, we wouldn't need the waterproofing at all, as, of course, what used to occur, um, you know, in previous centuries where they built them correctly. Awesome, mate. I appreciate you for coming on. I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to continue on. Okay. Mate. All right. So problems in education. Um, so New Zealand's leaky building syndrome is really relevant to why we have um, the same or similar issues happening with our leaky building syndrome. An overworked and poor regulatory framework, building control move from prescriptive to a more self-regulated regime. A building boom, Mediterranean style homes and apartments with no regard to moisture management, poor design that did not take into account good design principles, poor construction processes with few safeguards to ensure durability, poor application, apprenticeship scheme disbanded, poor building material technical support. And when you look at both of the, so this list, or received from another senior committee member, Carl Wooten, who's on here as well, who's on the Australian Standards um, Review Committee. You can really correlate both of these lists together. And that's, and what is to note that's not on here, and, and Nicole um, spoke about this not only in her report, but in the presentation prior to this, is the physical and psychological stresses that many have suffered and continue to suffer as a result of this. So in terms of where we're going as an industry, we're starting to see some really good things and, and New South Wales, so the building commissioner up there, David Chandler, is doing some great things and the hard iron fist approach, I think is what we've needed to shake up the industry. So 
I'm not going to break down all of the elements on this slide. Um, just a couple from an article that I, I saw he posted on LinkedIn a couple of days ago. So poor attention to products and materials. So that has been a big issue in Australia and, and it, it still will continue to be. So a lot of subcontractors or building contractors or industry put um, a lot of reliance on the products and that they will meet compliance. And it's found over time that it hasn't, particularly with combustible cladding for one example. So lack of compliance testing um, and lack of authenticity checks for materials. So on a good note, there has been an ARDA accredited lab in Australia set up now to test for compliance for um, AS4858 and AS4654.1 in terms of material testing which will give Australia another alternative other than the CSIRO or sending products over to New Zealand for brands testing. There are consultants that can assist teams in design, contact us at the AIW and we can put you in contact with the appropriate consultant because really it's an educational process. We all have to learn off each other to help improve and, and that's what we focus on at the AIW is help to provide awareness and education and design assistance. And in terms of the last category on this slide, the implementation of digital technology and easily accessible technical webinars will help to support other training in the industry. Um, so training providers who deliver certificate three, so the apprenticeship training and manufacturers training. So every part has its place and we all need to work together and integrate together to help get it out there to the larger public. So according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, in the year of 2000, we were averaging 145 new dwellings on average per year. In 2020, Australia was averaging 220,000 homes being built every year with the number rising. This number excludes apartments. Obviously with COVID coming in last year, that the number would have changed a little bit of late. The pace of building has sped up dramatically over time, which has led to further cost cutting, underskilled workers being used, many undertrained, unsupervised to cope with the increased workloads and tighter margins. So there is a whole myriad of contributing factors across a whole range of different levels that have contributed to why we see so many failures. And you know, from a teaching perspective, one of the most common phrases I hear in the industry is that I've been doing this for 10 to 20 years without a failure. This is very common over my last seven years as a teacher, but the physical results would tell us that that may not be true. Collaboration is required across the industry. It is essential. One of the main causes of the problems we see is the lack of education across the board. Many design teams do not have a clear understanding of the correct principles and have long-term detrimental effects on the building in not only waterproofing as such, but all building trades. Many builders are more managers than hands-on now. So a heavy reliance is put onto the subcontractor to be an expert and many are not. The physical results are clearly telling us this and showing us this. Waterproofing for many years was very undervalued, but the way that we build now, we need to build to waterproof and then build post waterproofing. So it's heavily reliant on the preceding and following trades, having an awareness of the appropriate substrate installation, how to work around the waterproof membranes because they're not bulletproof and how do all of the building elements interact with each other. On the positive, we are starting to see and hear a new generation that have a first for learning and want to be led by industry. So us as associations, AOW, ACRA, the VBA, Standards Australia, we need to work together to help provide this information and get it out there from credible sources. As an industry, we need to set clearly defined goals, such as national trade licensing. Instead of why can't it be established, let's paint the picture 
of Australia with minimal issues and reverse engineer from that vision. Let's get onto the vision, work together and return the confidence back into the industry. So that pretty much concludes the presentation. I'd, I'd like to thank um, Gary from Watertight for initially asking me to um, get involved with this, then further to that ACRA for allowing me to jump on last minute. And lastly, the Australian Institute of Waterproofing. Um, we are really here to help support industry and provide awareness on waterproofing. So we've got a good bunch of members with a, a big range of knowledge that are passionate about reversing the trend. So um, we're a group of volunteer businesses who care about the Australian waterproofing industry. Australian and international members are welcome. And we look forward to forming strong affiliations moving forward in the industry. So that concludes my presentation. Um, and yeah, I'd like to pass it on to Nick who can pass it back on to Johanna. Thank you very much. Terrific. Yeah, no, thanks very much, Byron, for the uh, presentation and also uh, David Hepworth for the uh, little cameo uh, halfway through. Um, I'll keep things moving along um, uh, just to keep us on time, um, but quickly encourage you please to lodge your questions on the Q&A uh, section uh, so that we have some good questions to ask the presenters at the end. Um, but on to the next presenter, which is Johanna Fragoso from Arup. Um, and Johanna is the Senior Diagnostics and Remedial Engineer for Buildings in Melbourne. Johanna works in Melbourne's office within the uh, Vic slash SA Facades team and specialises in durability, diagnostics and remedial engineering. Uh, she has 17 years of industry experience and assisted in the delivery of projects across sectors, including commercial, health, rail and also infrastructure. Uh, Johanna has acted as the lead consultant for a significant number of facade repair and refurbishment projects around Australia, and her understanding of the deterioration, repair and protection of structures is developed by undertaking structural condition assessments, developing remedial options, overseeing repair process, and researching different types of cementitious and composite materials. Johanna's presentation today is going to cover common building facade defects and their causes. Uh, Joanna. Please uh, take the floor. Thank you, Nick. Let me just share the slide. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending this, set, this webinar. And I want to thank ACRA for inviting me to present today. The topic that I will be covering today is common building facade defects and their causes. Uh, the design of facades have an immediate impact, not only in the aesthetics of a building, but also in its appeal and its value. In the past, facade material selection was mainly based on the ability of a product to stand up against the elements whilst providing a pleasing appearance. The trends and styles of exterior cladding in commercial products are continually evolving in response to client demands and in consumer and users' perceptions. And in the current environment, these are not only being shaped by aesthetics anymore, but also for a desire for green space, events, energy and acoustic performance, sustainability, and with the tragedy in London's Greenfield uh, Tower and the issues with the Opal Tower in Sydney, fire safety and certification are at the forefront of all of our clients and consumer concerns. This presentation is introductory only due to time constraints, and it does not include any discussions on the impact of the various listed conditions on public safety and structural stability of buildings. Uh, these are only visual symptoms and refer to uh, types of facades common in Australia in the high and mid rise buildings. And it's by no means exhaustive but hopefully describes most of the typical facade problems that I've encountered during my years acting as a, 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 doing facade assessments. 
It refers to facade conditions only. Uh, roofing conditions are not including as well as waterproofing, which has already been covered. And it's important to note that these elements, waterproofing and roof integrity, have a significant impact in the performance of a facade. Uh, these the effects that I'm going to be talking to you today, uh, they shouldn't be uh, used in an isolated form. When diagnosing the effects on building facades, it's important to understand that there are uh, various possible causes and that we need to have a good overview of how the different elements of the facade and the heat and ventilation systems and the fire systems are all acting together. Building envelope. Well, um, facades are part of the building envelope as well as the roofing of any building structure. Uh, the main function of a building Facade is to act as the primary interface with external environment. It is the physical separator between the conditioned and the unconditioned environment of a building. The design and construction of the exterior of a building includes the resistance to air, water, heat, light, and noise transfer. It also includes broader aspects such as appearance, structure, safety, and fire and security. The main functions of the building envelope can be separated into three main categories. One, to support, uh, is, this is to resist and transfer structural and dynamic loads. Two, control the flow of matter and energy of all types. Three, finish to meet the desired aesthetics on the inside and the outside. Uh, the external environment is very dynamic. People want the internal environment to be constant, to create a good atmosphere with low energy and high comfort for its occupants. occupants. So uh, the design should mainly rely on the building envelope and then on the services. Traditional facade systems. Uh, load bearing masonry construction is the most widely used of form of construction for large buildings, particularly in the 1700s to the mid 1900s. It's very rarely used today for large buildings, but it's still being used for small scale buildings up to five stories. It consists of thick, heavy masonry walls of brick or stone, and it supports the entire structure. They are usually joined by mortar and in contrast with uh, most construction today, is uh, most construction today is not load bearing masonry, but frame structures of light by but strong materials that support floor slabs and have very thin and light internal and external walls. Uh, the key idea with load bearing masonry is that each of the elements acts as a load carrying element. The high weight of these walls actually help to hold the building together and stabilize it against external forces such as wind and earthquake. And it was and still is the very popular type of facade construction due to its durability and its higher fire resistance. I'm going to give uh, an overview of the different types of defects for each material and also for the system as a whole. Uh, but obviously, I'm just going to cover some of the common defects because uh, the list is, uh, it, could, it, could, it could be quite long, like different defects. There's way too many materials in the side and too many defects per material, and we don't have the time to cover them all today, unfortunately. So with masonry type, uh, masonry materials, the typical defects are, uh, we could have some crazing, uh, crazing, uh, when we are looking at crazing, we mainly need to look for fine cracks that uh, don't have any sort of clear directional pattern. Some of the possible causes are improper brick manufacture and quality, and this usually occurs in glazed brick. Uh, 
cracks in brick structures. Uh, in this particular photo, we're looking at cracks that do not go through the mortar joints. And this mainly is um, signed that there could be some constraints in the ceramic expansion of the brick, or there could be the, the brick could have a high saturation rate. Then we have erosion and pitting abrasion. Uh, what to look for? We should look for some extremely small cavities in the surface of the brick and some minuscule disintegration of the surface. And the probable cause could be a poor quality of the brick or that the surface has been previously cleaned by some blasting or there has been some improper clean methods utilized. Staining, a stain is usually a thin layer of deposits, uh, usually caused by external factors such as smoke, uh, rust of corroding, uh, steel elements adjacent to the brick facade. And it, it's mostly of aesthetic nature. It doesn't have any sort of uh, damaging effect on the brick itself. The organic growth, uh, signs to look for alga mulch uh, growth and it's usually due to a uh, water water and moisture uh, presence on the surface of the brick or even behind the the brick uh, wall itself and if fluorescence the fluorescences uh, usually manifest in a white powdery substance on the surface of the brick and most of the probable causes are water flowing through the masonry that induces the migration of water and that in combination with soluble salts present in brick and the mortar and in the grout uh, cause uh, this uh, white substance and then again it's mostly of aesthetic nature Brick spalling and the lamination uh, usually manifests in the outer surface of the masonry uh, wall splitting apart. There is an uneven break of the outer face. Um, the bricks, usually some bricks have already detached or are about to fall. Uh, the probable causes, uh, it's more common in glazed brick and coated brick where migration of water out of the brick unit is severely blocked by lack of permeability of the outer layer, or it could be as well when the brick face is under an even local compression, such as um, the strength of the pointing mortar highly exceeds the strength of the brick, or there is some expansion or shortening of adjacent um, metal elements or is constrained then uh, we have peeling of coatings. Uh, if uh, the brick wall, sorry, if the brick wall has a coating, this could potentially be, and this is occurring, it could be potentially due to uh, inadequate material selection, uh, the presence of non breathable coatings, and because of moisture accumulation. Uh, due to the presence of the coated that does not allow enough uh, vapor permeability. And we have brick coving, which is when the cavity or the hollowing of the brick, um, it, this is particularly common in areas where there is standing water or they are close to ground level and um, the loss of material, the, it manifests in loss of material. Then we have as well wet walls, uh, which usually manifest in um, stains, water stains in some areas and in other areas dry, they, they, they are dry. And this is probably caused by dampness rising for, from foundations or problems with mechanical and plumbing systems. Mortar joints. Uh, some of the typical defects on the mortar joints are uh, eroded mortar, uh, which uh, it could be due to erosion due to, to wind or disaggregating of the lime component of the binder. 
uh, open eroded mortar joints. Uh, that is the loss of the outer layers of the mortar, the depth of erosion. Uh, like we should look, be looking at the depth of the erosion on the ground in relation to the outer surface of the brick, uh, the condition of the brick surface and edges. And if possible, we should try to find like a reference point, maybe an area where the original tool grout still is, maintains its original condition. So we can uh, have like a point of reference on what, the location and the extent of that deterioration on the mortar joint, the disintegration of the joint, which uh, could be caused by dissolving of constituents, especially lime in water. Uh, and this is particularly a problem in areas where water is trapped um, or where there is sulfate attack, which is not very common in the Australian environment where commercial buildings are located. And in this case, the mortar loses its binding function and the brick is practically being held by gravity forces and friction and friction is quite highly dependent on the level of humidity and the weight of the elements above the wall. Then uh, we have missing mortars, uh, which is the same, similar to the other type of uh, defects and more to joints, mainly due to, it could be inadequate uh, construction practices. It could be the disaggregating of the lime uh, due to water presence. And here we have improper joint repair. Um, this is quite common. We see this quite commonly when doing inspections and uh, it usually is because of the lack of compatibility between the existing uh, grout material and the repair material being used and the lack of sufficient depth on the repointing. I just quickly go through cracks on masonry facades. Uh, so we have longitudinal cracks, vertical cracks, stepped cracks. We have separation of the outer skin of cavity walls and the crack and the bonding of render. Uh, the, for longitudinal and vertical cracks, uh, this is usually this usually occurs when due to high loading, and when there are forces out of plane uh, from inside the masonry, this could be like embedded steel corrosion or adjacent um, steel elements or steel frame elements that are corroding and that. Uh, rust or corrosion expands and it causes uh, forces that subsequently cause cracking on the brick elements. Um, the stepped cracks, uh, they are usually uh, the result of uh, stresses where the masonry, the stresses exceed the resistance of the masonry to these uh, forces. Uh, sometimes it could be as well, like as particularly with the separation of the outer wife, it could be failure of the ties between the internal skin and the outer skin. And with the crack and the bonding of render is usually caused by failure of adherence between the render and the masonry, or sometimes it could be as well that there is some failure on the substrate or there's some built up of water uh, due to, uh, you know, um, maybe some uh, water ingress in the structures directly above the, the wall or elements of the facade directly above the wall. Uh, other types of failures um, in masonry walls, um, we have bowing, we have out of plumb, which are usually caused by movement of the building structure due to structural weaknesses. We have diagonal cracks. Uh, these diagonal cracks, uh, they usually originate on one side of openings or across the spandrels 
and uh, it could be caused by lateral displacement, heavier loaded areas that tend to move upwards, and it could occur soon after erection. Um, other causes could be deflection of lintels. Um, this photograph shows intersecting diagonal cracks, uh, connecting openings, and some of the causes could be a structural weakness as a shear wall under the action of reversible loads such as wind and thermal displacement or successive loads acting in opposite directions. Just cool. I'm conscious of time, so I'm just trying to speed it up. So stone facades, dimensional stone facades have been used in Australia since the 1800s. More recent facades use thin stone veneer and slab type veneer. A stone facing was used in all facade systems. In all the facade systems, the most common backing was masonry. In more recent times, the support structure is usually a steel or a steel studs. In most cases, the stone elements are anchoring to the backing for lateral support. In some cases, this support is used as well to withstand the load from the weight of the stone. And in some facades, uh, the stone is only used as decorative elements, such as uh, on the base or bands. The principal elements of a stone facade is the type, the quality of the natural stone, the alignment of the units, the tightness of the joints, the use of adequate uh, joint material, the different types and conditions of anchorage and support. Some of the common defects in stone are uh, obviously cracking and cracking uh, sometimes it could be due to imperfections on the stone itself or sometimes it could be due to concentration of vertical stresses due to non-uniform transmission of loads from above or excessive movement of supporting elements or corrosion of the steel behind the panels or anchoring elements. We could have some uh, displacement of bulging of stone panels, and this could be due to failure or loosening of anchorage, a sliding of stone of horizontal supports, movement of underlying systems such as frame shortening, expansion due to corrosion products uh, built up between masonry, the backup or masonry material or the steel support structure and the face panels. And some things that we should consider further is that when stone elements carry vertical loads from above, the condition can lead to backlink failure. The, the lamination, um, the delamination of the stone is usually caused, is like the lamination is the separation of that outer layer of the stone material, and then it usually occurs along the natural bedding plan, plane of the stone. And it can happen in vicinity of water, and it's due, you know, to, uh, to water running through it. We could have spalling due to corrosion of anchorage elements. Um, this uh, bowing on marble panels, marble panels are not being widely used for facade construction anymore. It's, it's usual, especially on thin marble panels uh, that bowing occurs. And this is due to the permanent expansion of stone panels when they are being restrained by adjoining panels or anchors or framing systems. And it's due to accumulation of irreversible thermal expansion. There could be as well erosion. This is particularly common in architectural fissures, um, decorative fissures such as carvings and it's caused by the long-term action of wind and rain. And in efflorescence, it, it could be due to um, 
let's say, deposits that occur uh, where the lime or the grout has been dissolved and due to moisture transmission, it reacts with the atmospheric carbon dioxide and form calcium, calcium carbonate or leachate deposits. These two defects are mainly, are mainly of aesthetic nature. Organic growth, which is uh, when the panels, uh, that it hasn't been a good design detailing, uh, such as in flat edges, and therefore water is accumulating and organic growth occur. And concrete facades. Um, concrete facades, there are two different types of concrete facades, cast in place or precast concrete. Um, Cracks in reinforced concrete facades uh, restraint to deformation is the basic cause of concrete cracking. It is essentially the lack of freedom of concrete elements to respond to movements or volume changes. Um, different sources of restraint exist in concrete structures, such as from adjacent elements, and the type with an orientation of cracking in a structural member provides an indication on the cause and the potential risks from it. It could be due to thermal overstresses and exposed facade uh, concrete cracks are most usually the result of corrosion of the reinforcing bars. The reinforcing bars have not been sufficiently protected by the depth of concrete cover and are likely to corrode due to carbonation or to chloride elements. Subject to concrete Subject to the corrosion expansion of the reinforcement, the concrete will crack or spall. And these are this next slides shows different types of cracking concrete. It starts as hairline and then it starts as the widening of the crack allows water penetration. The crack keeps widening and eventually results in the lamination. There could be as well some spalling of concrete when it's surrounding steel elements such as columns or beams due to insufficient cover or inadequate uh, quality on the concrete. And crazing, uh, crazing this is a uh, very thin cracks in a mapping sort of um, pattern. And they're mostly due to um, defects during the construction in the plastic state of the concrete. In the next slide, um, I have, you can see in the first uh, photograph, a slippage of facade elements of uh, concrete panels and this could be due to failure of the stone anchoring system or corrosion built up on the, uh, the shelf angles or the use of inadequate anchor systems. By that, I mean uh, using of mild steel or coating steel that is not suitable for the environment where the facade is located at. Uh, there could be some spalling on the concrete uh, due to, uh, then again, similar to what I had uh, shown before with uh, masonry, uh, the use of non-breathable coatings. And there could also be crack at joints of the precast panels. Uh, and this could be due to insufficient number of anchorage system or inadequate anchorage system, or uh, just um, poor construction practices. Metals. Metals can be found in buildings as basic components of the structure. They are also found in devices and systems used to support and anchor the facade elements. Corrosion is the most common form of deterioration of metal in buildings, and it's an electrochemical oxidization process that results in the deterioration of the metal. Apologies. 
I'm sorry, someone is calling. I'm trying to get rid of it. Other forms of corrosion are galvanic, which is due to contact of dissimilar metals. And this is widely observed in facade inspections. Um, there we also have uh, some pitting or crevice corrosion, uh, which can occur al in aluminum and stainless steel as well. Coating deteriorations. Um, Sorry. Um, I'm just going to talk generally about coating deteriorations because then again, this is a massive topic, uh, but some of the typical types of uh, failures of coatings in building facades are adhesion failure uh, due to inadequate material selection or inadequate substrate preparation, abrasion, which could be caused uh, by impact forces, for example, from the BMU or from people doing maintenance activities uh, from rope access, uh, rust staining, and this is usually due to inadequate thickness of the coating system, or as well a inadequate selection of the system for the location where the facade is. And there could be some alligating, alligatoring, sorry, which uh, is probably caused by internal stresses in the coating where the surface shrinks faster than the body of the paint film. Uh, and most commonly we see choking and this is particularly common with a, you know, aluminum finishes and, a, and stainless steel, coated stainless steel, and it's due to aging of the coating. Modern facades, a, a curtain wall system is an outer covering of the building, in which the outer walls are non-structural. They are utilized only to keep the weather out and the occupants in. Since the curtain wall is not structural, it can be made of lightweight materials, thereby reducing uh, construction costs. When glass is used as the curtain wall, an advantage is that natural light can penetrate deeper within the building. The curtain wall facade does not carry any structural load from the building other than its sway induced by wind and seismic forces acting on the building, and it supports its own weight. Uh, they are typically designed with extruded aluminum framing elements. Although the first curtain walls were made with steel frames, the aluminum frame is typically filled with glass, which provides an architectural pleasing building as well as benefits such as day lighting. Um, and they differ from storefront systems in that they are designed to span multiple floors. And we need to take into consideration thermal expansion and contraction, water diversion, and thermal efficiency for cost-effective heating, cooling, and lighting of the building. The basic curtain wall systems We have, they can be classified by the method of fabrication installation into a stick systems and into unitized systems. The unitized systems are composed of large units that are assembled and glazed in the factory and they are cheap to site and erected. Um, the modules are generally constructed one story tall and could be a few modules forming a width of a panel. Um, the vision glass is predominantly insulating glass and may have one or two lights laminating, laminated. And usually it's fixed, but sometimes it could be glazed into operable window frames that are incorporated into the curtain wall framing. The spandrel panels include opacified uh, glass, metal panels, thin stone, and other materials such as uh, fiber cement sheets. The glass, some of the typical defects that we encounter with glass are, um, but glass has been used for a thousand years. It allows daylight into the building while providing weather protection. 
uh, architectural glass comes in three different strength categories, annealed glass, which is the most commonly used because it's not heat treated and therefore it's not subject to distortion. Heat treated, heat strengthened, a fully tempered glass, which is heat treated and quenched in such a way that it creates residual surface compression in the glass. The surface compression gives the glass a higher resistance to breakage than to anneal glass. And heat strengthened glass has at least twice the strength and resistance to breakage from wind loads and thermal stresses as a new glass. Fully tempered glass, it provides at least four times the strength of a new glass and it gives a superior resistance to glass breakage. Um, so there are different types of glass systems. Uh, we have laminated glass, we have coated glass, tinted glass, insulated glass units. And the difference between the different types of glass is the way that it breaks a new glass. It breaks easily, it produces these, these long, sharp splinters. The tempered glass it shatters completely under higher levels of impact energy, and a few pieces remain in the frame. And in laminated glass, it may crack under pressure, but it tends to remain integral, adhering to the plastic vinyl interlayer. Some of the typical defects that we encounter in with glass, it could be condensation in double glazed units, which is the buildup of moisture inside the unit because of temperature changes or fluctuations uh, of moisture in the exterior and the interior through air ingress through the discontinuities of the perimeter seal. The thermal stress, which um, is created when one area of the glass pane gets hotter than the adjacent areas. This is particularly quite uh, becoming a problem at the moment because of the wide use of sunshade structures. Uh, a spontaneous breakage, which occurs in, sorry. In toughened glass. Uh, when glass is heated in the toughened process, nickel sulfide inclusions, which is what you can see in the right hand side of this photo, uh, shift from a low temperature state to a high temperature state and they shrink. And as the glass ages, these inclusions return to their low temperature state and they expand and it creates this spontaneous breakage. It usually takes around five to 10 years to occur. And of course, impact damage, which is quite common and it's due to external forces. It could be from BMU or from maintenance activities or from vandalism. Uh, with laminated glass, uh, the most common defect is the edge debonding, the, the, the debonding of the edge of the laminate. Um, when exposed to an impact load, the glass breaks very quickly and in laminated glass, the interlayer holds these fragile panels in panes of glass together, hence the bond between the supporting structure and the edge of the glass and between the glass and the interlayer are crucial to ensure that this breakage behavior is achieved. Uh, the delamination of laminated glass usually occurs along the edges or around fixings, such as the one shown in this photo, and it's most prevalent in paints where PVV interlayer is used. Uh, with sealants, uh, the typical types of um, Failure in sealants are uh, the cohesion failure, adhesion failure, a failure in shear. Uh, due to aging, the sealant can become a little bit tacky. It, become, it turns again into this sort of moist condition where it loses its strength uh, capacity. And with gaskets, the most common type of defect that we see is the dropping of gaskets, and this could be due to thermal expansion of the different elements of the facade, or it could be due, due to aging 
of the um, gasket and therefore shrinking. Uh, we also see a lot of this uh, shrinking of the ends of the gaskets. And then again, it's due to uh, weathering and uh, just aging. Uh, just some other defects on fenestration framings. We usually see a lot of gaps, especially when it's metal to metal elements. Uh, we see this continuous application of sealant joints uh, in interfaces between different types of materials. Uh, sometimes uh, there is a splitting in the sealant because this is particularly common on louvers when uh, the louvers are smaller uh, than the opening uh, on the facade main material. And therefore, like uh, there is an inadequate uh, width to depth uh, joint or detailing or the use of inadequate types of sealants. And in this photo, we can see some dried um, Coking, and um, it's, this is mainly due to aging, and sometimes there's that debonding when the frame materials are corroding. Um, other types of common of common defects are when there is spaces between uh, glazing gaskets and the trim covers, detachment of trim covers. Uh, or the louvers blades uh, because of corrosion of the fixings or insufficient fixings. Uh, we see a lot of uh, bent corners of pressure bars and some inadequate application of secondary seals on um, insulated glass units. Uh, this is just an, uh, a figure that shows uh, the different different types of failures that we see in glazing systems. Uh, we have- Joanna? Yes. We are uh, sorry to interrupt, just to let you know you're at about 35 minutes. So if you could um, work your way to your conclusion, just so that we could have some questions before the session's out. Sure. Apologies uh, for interrupting. No, that's all right. It's, I think I was uh, trying to cover too much <laughs> in a very short period of time. Uh, but uh, just the conclusion, uh, I guess, what I would like to conclude is uh, I definitely agree that there needs to be a better, uh, a better communication between the different uh, people that, that uh, are part of the maintenance and the design and the management of building facades. Uh, there's got to be better regulation. And uh, I agree what's been said before, like uh, water penetration is definitely one of the main causes of deterioration of facade materials and elements. Thank you very much, Johanna, for your presentation. And uh, to all speakers, uh, thank you for the uh, time you've invested in putting those presentations together and, and equally uh, the time that uh, you've uh, put in uh, during this webinar. Um, we do have uh, a few questions to work through, so um, I will uh, just read those out and try and direct them to the uh, presenter that I think can best uh, address those. Uh, first question is from Paul Evans. Um, uh, his question is, uh, he would like to gain an understanding of defects from water and what percentage are plumbing versus waterproofing membrane works. And Byron, you're probably best positioned to take that one, if you don't mind. I've got a feeling he might have directed that one to Nicole Johnson. <laughs> ah, okay, no, more than happy for Nicole to take it. <laughs> um, thanks very much for the question. And I think it's, um, I think it's something that we've, we need to do further work on. So um, in my report, I sort of, I do break it down. So you'll see the percentage um, of the audits that we did and how they're categorised in relation to membrane failures and different other water um, failures. One thing that did happen as a consequence um, of that report is some forensic plumbers, which I didn't know there were forensic plumbers, got in contact with me and said, 
more work needs to be done to investigate um, plumbing related defects that haven't really been captured in any way in these in this in my report and in, in other research. And so we are now in June starting a big project looking at plumbing related defects um, and sort of the causes and, and, and contributors to those sorts of defects and looking at it sort of in much more detail. So hopefully by the end of the year, I'll have a better answer for you um, when we break that down. But the report in itself does highlight some of those, but as I said, it was a pilot study and by no means would I would say that there's a that they could be generalised in any way. It's just um, what we're seeing as a as a potential trend across those states. So um, there is a little bit of it, stuff there in the report. Have a look at, but I can't. Um, um, but I think we need to do more work to to answer that question concretely. Thanks for the response and uh, keep yourself off mute, uh, Dr. McCall, because uh, the next couple of questions are directed towards you. Okay. Um, the, the next question is. Uh, Builders are placing undue pressure on waterproofers to, to sign, design and construct contracts. Is this purely to avoid issues for themselves? Oh, um, I'm not actually sure if I can answer that um, because we didn't speak to a lot of builders in our project. And I think that's something that we need to um, look at exactly what's going on on building sites. Um, I don't know, maybe someone else might be able to speak to that a bit better. Byron. Sorry, I was typing one to Gary. Uh, <laughs> so, by placing undue pressure on waterproofs to sign, do it, design and construct contracts, is this purely to avoid issues? <laughs> That's a bit of an open ended question. Um, what the physical results are telling us, and from the research that's been done and the data that has been captured, which hasn't been captured for a long enough period of time, the design and construct model places most parties in a significant position of enhanced risk. So I attended a VCAT hearing last week and you know, to answer your second question to live Gary, if something hasn't been installed appropriately and then you touch it, you're placed in a position where you've accepted what's happened before you. Now, ultimately, one thing that's come from an educational standpoint or a functional standpoint within the industry is there's no cohesiveness amongst a lot of building practitioners and trades within the industry anymore. It's sort of turned into the, to use the phrase, every man for himself. And a lot of this pressure has been put on from design and construct and tighten um, allowances for quality workmanship. So <clears throat> if you touch it, you own it. Builders, oh, I can't really answer on behalf of whether a builder is putting a contract in place like that. So um, it avoids issues for them, but you, sometimes you've got to go with your gut. <laughs> You know, if, you, if your gut's telling you that uh, something doesn't feel right, then maybe it's not. I can only answer from my perspective. If I didn't think something was suitable for me to want to warranty the work, then I wouldn't go there. Simple as that. Okay, thanks for that, Byron. No um, another question from Gary uh, directed to uh, Dr. Nicole. Uh, if waterproof assigns a DNC design and construct contract without the relevant insurances, uh, assuming he's referring to PI, uh, what are the ramifications? Oh, um, a good question. And I don't think I'm in a position to answer that either. Um, Byron, did you want to say something about waterproofing in particular? Um, oh, yeah, from a, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> well, I'm not a lawyer in this area, so I probably... Oh, yeah. <laughs> If you're asking some mm -hmm. people, Gary, is this what you've got me on here for? <laughs> so, um, yeah. From what I, I know, even from, because I'm going down the path of entertaining disclaimers and a lawyer will always put something in place so they've got to get out of jail clause. That's the best I could answer this question. So I, I really got no idea without seeing any credible information or the documentation or getting... A, a lawyer to, who's experienced in this area to answer the question effectively. Yep, 
I suppose one of the first things would be that if the contractor requires that you hold the insurance, you're in breach of contract to begin with, um, and then you're obviously uh, potentially liable uh, in the instance of a design issue for uh, any any costs associated with that issue. Uh, you know, I did withdraw. Sorry, Nick, I did withdraw a slide just because I was very conscious of the thirty minutes. And waterproofing itself requires a multi-stage inspection process. And that's five or six stages of inspection. And where we're currently at in terms of understanding design and how that can contribute to long-term functional breakdown, the design review is the first part of that process. And if we don't re review the design and the critical elements, and how function, functionally it will work long-term for that particular area, and then marry that in with the buildability components. In a lot of cases, we're setting ourselves up to fail. You know, we can look at thermal efficiency of buildings and then the onset of condensation within wall cavities. So we've built th more th thermally efficient buildings that have now contributed to more condensation issues within our environment. So from speaking to senior guys who are a little bit more scientific than I am and have done a bit of research on this area, one person can let out between 1,000 millilitres and if you're very fit, so it, it's, you know, like a, an Olympic swimmer, a couple of litres of moisture through breathing per night. Where does that go if it can't escape the internal environment? What does it lead to? It leads to bacterial growth and then the onset of mold. And where we have so many moving parts, like there was a comment that David said earlier that if things are built properly, you could get away without having waterproof membranes. That's right to a degree if you use the right building elements. But in saying that, the waterproofing, the waterproofing materials themselves are expected and designed to accommodate the, the, the strains and the stresses that the building's put into. So once again, there's just not one clear rule. But to touch on what Dehanna concluded with that industry, so credible industry and knowledgeable people need to work together across the board to try and create some consistency around Australia, not state to state. It's, we've got to start working out a uniform process. Otherwise, we're just going to have this issue going on for many, many, many more years to come. Thanks, Byron. Um, uh, probably not going to have time to get through all questions and uh, uh, conclude on time, but uh, I'd just like to direct a question that Paul Evans uh, has raised uh, for Johanna, which is, would a coating of waterproof membrane on Rio mesh before pour assist with stopping or slowing the rusting Rio and subsequent spalling issues? Sorry, Nick, you're breaking up. Let me find the question. Uh, apologies. Yeah, it's from Paul Evans uh, at 1240. And it's uh, essentially would a coating of reinforcement uh, slow rusting or spalling issues in concrete? So, sorry, I don't have it. Could you repeat the question for me? Sorry. Sure. It's uh, would a coating of waterproofing membrane on Rio mesh before pour assist with stopping or slowing the rusting Rio and subsequent spalling issues? No, not really. I think it probably wouldn't be practical to do so. I think the main um, element on ensuring that uh, there is not corrosion of reinforcement in concrete is uh, the protection provided by the cover of the concrete cover to steel reinforcing. Uh, there are Australian standards that state for different types of environments what these a cover should be, and uh, also it's uh, it's depending on the type of concrete being used and the strength of the concrete. The second defense mechanism, of course, is the 
concrete itself, its composition, uh, the quality of, during the construction processes, vibration, and so on. Uh, if you wanted to reduce that uh, concrete cover, which occurs uh, particularly in civil infrastructure projects where they are trying to reduce cost or where there are some sorts of constraints uh, due to that, that dimensional constraints, uh, you could use anti-carbonation coatings to the exterior of the concrete uh, structure just to uh, reduce the migration of, or it could be anti-carbonation or chloride resistant coatings to prevent the migration of uh, these elements that cause the deterioration of the concrete and with water migration, subsequently the corrosion or an expansion of the steel reinforcing. Thank you. And uh, if uh, we can conclude with uh, one last question towards Dr. Nicole. This one's from Mike Rutherford. Uh, and, uh, reads, Dr. Nicole's research highlighted the non-standardisation between states and the disconnection between the NCC and Australian standards. NCC provides a legal framework for performance-based requirements. It is the responsibility of individual states and territories to administer what can be done to standardise and make national codes. Yes, wouldn't that be fantastic? Unfortunately, we have a federal system in Australia and getting everyone to agree um, about how to move forward with this is going to be very difficult and I can't see it happening um, if at all for a very long time and, and we've seen this we've seen an example of this with the combustible cladding um, process and and how every state has approached this so very differently um, we are really bad in this country um, about uniting um, in the states and territory to deal with some of these complex issues. And if, and I've seen the reaction to, you know, what's happened over the last two years when this has really come to the fore and the way that each government um, is approaching dealing with this crisis. And it's so varied. Um, it's actually very surprising that there's not really a united front in how to um, come together and make this um, um, this issue dealt with in so much in such a better way in relation to the regulatory requirements. Um, I think it absolutely needs to be done. I think we are, it is so big and we are in such a bad crisis that um, it will require everyone to come together and make sure that we've got the best type of regulatory framework moving forward. I just don't see that happening, unfortunately. And I think that's going to be one of the things that will prolong this crisis is because um, in each state, the approach, um, although yes, we do have the National Construction Code, um, the approach in so many different ways and the different types of regulations that form under this broader idea of um, you know construction regulation is so varied um, and I think that is the shame here that no one is learning the lessons from anyone else um, and we see this in multiple areas of regulation. Especially hotel quarantine for the Victorians. <laughs> thanks Nicole and, and look once again thanks uh, Byron, uh, Johanna, uh, for your time today. The presentations were great, a really uh, diverse uh, mix for the seminar. Um, and thanks also to the participants who've cut the time out of their day to attend the webinar. And uh, on behalf of uh, the Victorian ACTA Committee, we look forward to hopefully seeing you all in person sooner rather than later. Enjoy the rest of the day. Hi, Nick. Before you go, this is Nicole sure. Accra. Because we have so many questions left over and we, we have a lot of questions there, what I might do, I'll put them all together, I'll send them out to the presenters and see if they want to answer, all of them can answer, individually can answer, and then I'll send that out to all the registrants as well. Fantastic. Good. Thank you so much for your time today. Awesome, thank you everyone.